Hi everyone, so today we're reading chapter 10 and 11 of the Ichabog and then you'll have an activity to do on Purple Mash. So, chapter 10, King Fred's Quest. King Fred strode from the throne room feeling quite delighted with himself. Nobody would ever again say that he was selfish, vain and cruel. For the sake of a smelly, simple old shepherd and his worthless old mongrel, he, King Fred the Fearless, was going to hunt the Ichabog. True, there was no such thing, but it was still a dashed fine and noble... It was still dashed fine and noble of him to ride to the other end of the country in person to prove it. Quite forgetting lunch, the king rushed upstairs to his bedroom, shouted to his valet to come and help him out of the dreary back suit and help him into his battle dress, which he'd never had the chance to wear before. The tunic was scarlet with buttons of gold, a purple sash and lots of medals that Fred was allowed to wear because he was king. And when Fred looked in the mirror and saw how well battle dress became him, he wondered why he didn't wear it all the time. As his valet lowered the king's plumed helmet onto his golden curls, Fred imagined himself imagined himself wearing it seated on his favourite milk white charger and spearing a serpent like monster with his lance. King Fred the Fearless indeed. Why, he half hoped there really was an Ichabog now. Meanwhile, the chief advisor was sending word throughout the city within the city that the king was setting off on a tour of the country and that everyone should be ready to cheer him as he left. Herringbone made no mention of the Ichabog because he wanted to prevent the king from looking foolish, if he could. Unfortunately, the footmore, footman called Cankerby had overheard two advisers muttering together about the king's strange scheme. Cankerby immediately told the between maid, who spread the word all over the kitchens where a sausage seller from Baronstown was gossiping with the cook. In short time, by the time the king's party was ready to leave, word had spread all through the city within the city that the king was riding north to hunt the Ichabog, and news was beginning to leak out into wider Shoeville. Is it a joke? The, captain's the capital's inhabitants asked each other as they thronged out onto the pavements ready to cheer the king. What does it mean? Some shrugged and laughed and said the king was merely fu having fun. Others shook their heads and muttered that there must be more to it than that. No king would ride out on to the north of the country without good reason. What the worried folk asked each other. Does the king know that we do not? Lady Islander joined the other ladies of the court on the balcony to watch the soldiers as assembling. I shall tell you now a secret which nobody else knew. Lady Islander would never have married the king, even if he'd asked her. You see, she was secretly in love with, with a man called Captain Goodfellow, who was now chatting and laughing with his good friend Major Beamish in the courtyard below. Lazy Islander, who was very shy, had never been able to bring herself to talk to Captain Goodfellow, who had no idea that the most beautiful woman at court was in love with him. Both Goodfellow's parents, who were dead, had been cheesemakers from Kurzberg. Though Goodfellow was both clever and brave, these were the days in which no cheesemaker's son would expect to marry a high-born lady. Meanwhile, all the ser servants' children were being let out of school early to watch the battle party set off. Mrs Beamish, the pastry chef, naturally rushed to collect Bert so that he'd have a good spot to watch his father passing by. When the palace gates opened at last and the cavalc cavalcade rode out, Bert and Mrs Beamish cheered on at the top of their lungs. Nobody had seen better battle dress for a very long time. How exciting it was and how, ve how fine the sunlight played upon the golden buttons, silver swords and the gleaming trumpets of the buglers and up on the bal palace balcony the handkerchiefs of the ladies of the court fluttered in farewell like doves. At the front of the procession rode King Fred on his milk-white charger holding scarlet reins and waving at the crowds. Right behind him, riding a thin yellow horse and wearing a bored expression, was Spittleworth. And next came Flapoon, furiously lunchless and sitting on his elephantine, elephantine chestnut. That means very large, like an elephant. Behind the king and the two lords trotted the royal guard, all of them on dapple grey horses except for Major Beamish who rode his steel grey stallion. It made Mrs Beamish's heart flutter to see her husband looking so handsome. Good luck, Daddy, shouted Bert, and Major Beamish, though he really shouldn't have done, waved at his son. The procession trotted down the hill, smiling at the cheering crowds of the city within the city until it reached the gates in the wall onto wider Shoeville. There, hidden by the crowds, was Dove the Dovetail's cottage. Mr Dovetail and Daisy had come out into their garden and they were just able to see the plumes in the helmets of the Royal Guard riding past. Daisy didn't feel much interest in the soldiers. She and Bert were, still weren't talking to each other. In fact, he spent the morning at break with Roderick Roach, who often jeered at Daisy for wearing overalls instead of a dress, so the cheering and the sound of the horses didn't raise her spirits at all.
There really is, there isn't really a knickerbog daddy, is there? She asked. No, Daisy, sighed Mr Dovetail, turning back to his workshop. There's no Ichabog. But if the king wants to believe in it, let him. He can, can't do much harm up in the marshlands. Which just goes to show that even sensible men may fail to see a terrible looming danger. Ooh, exciting. Chapter 11, The Journey North. King Fred's spirits rose higher and higher as he rode out of Shoeville and into the, into the countryside. Word of the king's sudden expedition to find the Ichabog had now spread to farmers who wor worked the rolling green fields, and they ran with their families to cheer the king, who, the, law, the two lords and the royal guard as they passed. Not having had any lunch, the king decided to stop in Kurdsburg to eat a late dinner. We'll rough it here, chaps. Like the soldiers we are, he cried to his party as they entered the city famed for its cheese, and we'll set out again at first light. But, of course, there was no question of the king roughing it. Visitors at Kurzberg's finest inn were thrown out onto the street to make way for him. So Fred slept that night in a brass bed with a duck-down mattress after a hearty meal of toasted cheese and chocolate fondue. The Lord Spittleworth and Flapoon, on the other hand, were forced to spend the night in a little room over the stables. Both were rather sore after a long day on horseback. You may wonder why it was, why that was if they went hunting five times a week. But the truth was that they generally sneaked off to sit behind a tree after half an hour's hunting, where they ate sandwiches and drank wine until it was time to go back to the palace. Neither was used to spending hours in the saddle, and Spittleworth's bony bottom was already starting to blister. Early the following morning, the king was... The king was brought word by Major Beamish that the citizens of Baringstown were very upset that the king had chosen to sleep in Kurzberg rather than their splendid city. Eve could not to dent his popularity, King Fred instructed, instructed his party to ride in an enormous circle through the surrounding fields, being, che being cheered by farmers, all the way so they ended up in Baringstown by nightfall. The delicious smell of sizzling sausages greeted the royal party, and a delighted crowd carrying torches escorted Fred to the best room in the city. There he was served roasted ox and honeyed ham and slept in a carved oak bed with a goose down mattress, while Spittleworth and Flapoon had to share a tiny attic room usually occupied by two maids. By now, Spittleworth's bottom was extremely painful and he was furious he'd been forced to ride 40 miles in a circle purely to keep the sausage makers happy. Flapoon, who'd eaten far too much cheese in Kurzberg and had consumed three beefsteaks in Baronstone, was awake all night groaning with indigestion. Next day, the king and his men set off again, and this time they headed north, soon passing through vineyards from which eager grape pickers emerged to wave cornucopian flags and receive waves from the jubilant king. Spittleworth was almost crying in pain in spite of the cushion he'd strapped to his bottom, and Flapoon's belches and moans could be heard even over the clatter of hooves and jangle of, jingle of bridles. Upon arrival in Jeroboam that evening, they were greeted by trumpets and the entire city singing the national anthem. Fred feasted on sparkling wine and truffles that night before retiring to a silk, silken four-poster bed with a swan's down mattress. But Spittleworth and Flapoon were forced to share a room up over the inn's kitchen with a pair of soldiers. Drunken Jeroboam dwellers were re reeling about in the street celebrating the presence of the king in their city. Spittleworth spent much of the night sitting in a bucket of ice and Flapoon, who drunk far too much red wine, spent the same period of being sick in a second bucket in the corner. At dawn the next morning, the king and his party set out for the marshlands. After a famous farewell from the citizens of Jeroboam, who saw him on his way with a, a thunderous popping of corks that made Spittleworth's horse rear and ditch him off in the road. Once they dusted Spittleworth off and put the cushion back on his bottom, and Fred had stopped laughing, the party proceeded. Soon they'd left Jeroboam behind and they could only hear birdsong. For the first time on their entire journey, the sides of the roads were empty. Gradually, the lush green land gave way to thin, dry grass, crooked cree trees and boulders. Extraordinary place, isn't it? The cheerful king shouted back to Spittleworth and Flapoon. I'm jolly glad to see these marshlands at you at last, aren't you? The two lords agreed, but once Fred had turned to face the front again, they made rude gestures and mouthed even ruder names at the back of his head. At last, the royal party came across a few people, and how the marshlanders stared. They fell to their knees like the shepherd in the throne room and quite forgot to cheer on clap but gaped as though they'd never seen anything like the king and their royal guard before, which indeed they hadn't, because king, while King Fred had visited all the major cities of Cornucopia after his coronation, nobody had thought it worth his while to visit the faraway marshlands. Simple people, yes, but rather touching, aren't they? The king called gaily to his men as some ragged children gasped at the 
magnificent horses, they'd never seen animals so glossy and well fed in their lives. And where were we supposed to stay the night? Flapoon muttered to Spittleworth, eyeing the tumble down stone cottages. No taverns here. Well, there's one comfort at least, Spittleworth whispered back. He'll have to rough it like the rest of us and we'll see how much he likes it. They rode through the afternoon and at last, there, as the sun began to sink, they caught sight of the marsh where the Ichabog was supposed to live. A wide stretch of darkness studded with strange rock formations. Your Majesty, called Major Beamish, I suggest we set up camp now and explore the marsh in the morning. As your Majesty knows, the marsh can be tre treacherous. Fogs come suddenly here. We'd do best to approach it by daylight. Nonsense, said Fred, who was jump bouncing up and down in his saddle like an excited schoolboy. We can't stop now when it's in sight, Beamish. The king had given his order, so the party rode on until at last, when the moon had risen and was sliding in, and out behind inky clouds, they reached the edge of the marsh. It was the eeriest place any of them had ever seen, wild and empty and desolate. A chilly breeze made the rushes whisper, but otherwise it was dead and silent. You see, sire, said Lord Spittleworth after a while, the ground is very boggy. Sheep and men alike would be stuck under if they were wandered out too far. Then the feeble-minded might take these giant rocks and boulders for monsters in the dark. The rustling of these weeds might even be taken for the hissing of some creature. Yes, very true, very true, said the King Fred, but his eyes still roamed over the dark marsh as if though he expected the Ichabog to pop up from behind a rock. Shall we pitch camp then, sire? asked Lord Flapoon, who'd saved some cold supplies from Baronstein and was eager for his supper. We can't expect to find an imaginary monster in the dark, pointed out Spittleworth. True, true, repeated King Fred regretfully. Let us, good gracious, how foggy it has become. And sure enough, as they stood, looking out across the marsh, a thick white fog had rolled over them so swiftly and silently that none of them had noticed it. OK, so for today's activity, what I'd love for you to do is you are going to write a postcard home to, um, to Cornucopia where they have um where you can choose to be either Lord Flapoon, Lord Spittleworth or King Fred and you need to write back about the different places you've visited so you've just arrived at Marsh in the Marsh Town you're up in um you're going to have got to the part with the fog so you're up to the end of this chapter and you're going to write back saying all the places you've been and what happened in each of the places. So, for example, if you were King Fred, you'd talk about the different beds you slept in and the fine meals and how nice it was to see everyone waving and shouting. If you were Lord Flapoon or Lord Spittleworth, um, you've had a rather different journey. So I want you to write back and say things about how your bottoms all blistered and you haven't been able to sleep or you've had indigestion or you find, drank far too much wine and ended up feeling ill all night and then you've arrived at the Marshton and oh sticks the cat has arrived to say hello yes yes i can see you um so i want you to do that no don't change the don't change the page um and you're going to, i look forward to seeing them and i'm going to leave a gap so you can put a little picture as well of maybe your favorite place that you've been on your journey or something like that so it'd be lovely to see and i'll pop that up onto purple mash for you so remember you are either king fred lord flapoon or lord spittleworth writing a postcard back um about the places that you have been on your journey <laughs>